The following episode is brought to you by Poison City Brewing, proud makers of Durban Poison Cannabis Lager, the beer that invites you to live your poison. This is the this is this is the second take for anyone who's listening, jumping in right here. It's the second introduction. First one was behind the scenes. This one is like now. I'm the CP Zwane and I'm here with Marcel Smuts today. We've got a brand new artist for you. And uh yeah, man, this guy's super cool. And uh it's another artist courtesy of um Devo. And yeah, we're super stoked to have him. I want to let him introduce himself. His name is Kenny. Brother, what do you do? Man, I am a blues artist, dude. That's the Beginning and end of my name, eh? <laughs> yeah, dude, that is so sick. Like, yeah, like a hundred percent, dude. Like, with 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 your name being Kenny Hughes, is that like a stage name or is that like a, not at all, dude? You know, God given, like I'm afraid. Eh? <laughs> yeah, dude, that is so sick, though. Like, um, I, I you know, Devo is sending through, you know, some of your basically information and whatnot. And one of the interesting things that popped up for me was that, you know, you used to be a drummer before you picked up a guitar. Now, yeah. as, you know, anyone who might might be not listened in the past, you know, I'm a drummer myself and Marcel's a guitarist. And dude, like, sort of talk me through, like, w- like what happened? Like, why did you sort of transition, you know, from being a drummer to being a guitarist in the first place? Oh, well, dude, uh, the guy that was giving me drum lessons, I started drums when I was nine. And um, yeah, so he taught everything. He gave drum lessons, bass, guitar, vocals, keys, everything, right? Um, And so what he did every year was he would group all his students up together in different bands and then have like a show, like a showcase type thing where each band would then play a song or two maybe. And um, I was jamming with this band. We jammed uh, Have You Ever Seen the Rain by Credence. And I just remember looking over at the guitarist and I just thought, that dude's having a lot more fun than I am. (laughs) So I asked my parents, like, sweet man, can I please um, try out guitar, like try my hand at guitar? And yeah, the the next year I started jamming guitar and I haven't looked back. eh? Yeah, and and just, you know, just on that point where I was like, Marcel, you know, is also a guitarist and whatnot. I just want to sort of get from you guys, um, both being guitarists, you know, would you guys say um, there is a massive difference when it comes to, you know, like uh, different sort of genres when it comes to playing guitar? Or is it all like a similar thing in terms of maybe structures and scale and theory and shit for someone who's like a lay person like myself? Are there any similarities at all considering that Marcel is like a beatal guitarist? And, you know, you are within your genre as well, uh, Kenny, bro. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, Marcel, you want to take this one, dude? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly. So, Naz, I, I'm sure we've had this discussion before. But... I, I probably wasn't there, dude. <laughs> so the thing is, is that I, while each genre has its own sort of twist on things, you know, that there would be certain techniques that would be more prominent in one genre to the next. I started out learning blues. I mean, that was where I, I started learning to play guitar and, you know, I started gravitating towards metal from there. And metal also kind of started deriving from the blues scene as well. It, it has some of its roots there as well. So sort of everything is really intertwined. Kenny, I don't know if you agree with that. 100%, dude. Um, I actually think it's got a lot less to do with just what's being done on guitar, and it's got a lot more to do with the whole band. So the band as a whole determines which direction the tune will go in. You know what I mean? Like you can jam a, a metal song on an acoustic guitar, and you can jam a blues tune on an acoustic guitar and a lot of the notes will be the same. You know what I mean? So I, I'd say the, the band as a whole has got a lot to do with the vibe of the tune. No, 100%. I mean, the, the biggest thing that the, the blues and metal share is that flat fifth, that, that blues note. I mean, that's yeah, exactly. that they, they both share because in metal, in the context, it gets used to sound as like sort of evil as possible. And blues, it kind mm. of has a you know the, the devil's note and blues has always been associated exactly. with the crossroads and stuff like that so you know between blues and metal they, they share a lot of i guess you could say theory similarities and then it's just 100 like he's saying the rest of the band that's the artists that contribute all around 
Yeah, exactly, man. It's it's like uh, the guitar is just a piece of the puzzle. You know what I mean? Like the the rest of the band has to sort of create the fuller picture. Um, so yeah, I'd say there's definitely a lot of similarities. It, it doesn't matter which genre you're playing, man. I mean, at the end of the day, everything sort of did start with the blues, and so yeah. there's going to be remnants of the blues in every genre you play. So yeah, definitely, dude. Yo, that is 100 percent sure guys thank you for that quick lesson like i i feel like i've learned you know quite a bit in that in that in those few minutes yeah marcy <laughs> yeah but like one of, one of the things that i wanted to ask right off the bat man is your voice is deceptive considering how first of all how you speak and judging off appearances like how how long did it take you to develop your style of vocals man like it's it's a very gruff of very obviously blues and it's very like how do i say it jesus i'm tongue-tied uh <laughs> looks, can, looks can be deceiving kind of thing <laughs> i hear you man um dude i don't really know like there was there was a period where i was a smoker so i guess camel black aided it had something to do with it man <laughs> you know um oh man i don't know dude it's like you know you get you get the thing you're interested in and then you sort of work towards, like you've got this image in your mind of what you want to sound like. And I guess whether consciously or subconsciously, I was slowly moving um, closer and closer towards that. So, I mean, I'm still in process. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm there yet. I definitely don't sound how I want to sound yet, but I feel like I'm on the right track, man. So um, I don't know. I never, I never went for a vocal lesson or anything like that. I've, my voice is basically a mixture of everything I've ever heard, I guess. Mm. You know, the, the, the teacher, bro, that you mentioned when we started off this interview, the guy yes. that, was, that would basically get everyone together and sort of play. How, you know, how much of an influence would you say he's had on your career as a musician, like, in total? I mean, I know you did start off drumming when he was teaching you, but would you say you owe anything to, to him and what he taught you back then? Oh, 100%, dude. Uh, no, definitely 100%. So... I actually taught guitar for a little while as well. And I taught for a school. So I saw the way that this school uh, teaches and how they approach their lessons and everything. And it just gave me such an appreciation for the way I was taught. Because every step of the way, I was fighting against how the school wanted me to teach my students. Because the way that I learned, honestly, I'd say is the best. And I mean, it's might just be because it's my playing that came from it or whatever and it might just be my opinion but yeah I owe the guy a hell of a lot man he gave me such a strong foundation dude like he taught me the absolute basics that you really really need to know as a guitarist I mean my first lesson I started with open chords you know what I mean as opposed to other schools that teach single string playing for a while like twinkle twinkle little star that type of stuff so yeah, man, I owe the guy the world, dude. And one day I'll give him a piece of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is fire, dude. You know, we, we, we on Sludge Underground, you know, we've had this thing, you know, from the get-go where it's sort of like it's a spur-of-the-moment thing. You know, we don't really prepare or anything like that. And I must give a shout-out to Megan, who has sort of influenced, you know, the way some of these uh, in interviews have been going. Like, I actually did a bit of digging, and I went through your Instagram, dude like a stalker with right. and uh, <laughs> yeah 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 um, one of <laughs> one of your very first posts bro like uh i'll, I'll, I'll read it out to you was sometimes life knocks you down just kick it in the balls and move on dude like yeah what like what what, what was sort of behind that bro like what what was that even part <laughs> of those some lyrics um like what's happening there dude not at all man so that's actually on like one of those i wrote it on one of those little um office cube paper things and the reason i wrote it on office cube paper is because it was sitting in an office so at that point i was actually selling insurance and it was right around that time dude that i realized that this is definitely not what i want to do like every day i walk into the office i feel a little piece of my soul stays behind outside you know what i mean and then yeah that day was just I'd had enough, man. <laughs> so I just wrote that down and like stuck it on my cubicle wall. And every day I looked at it, I just moved further and further away from the the corporate world and closer and closer to what I wanted to be doing. So it was the sort of a self-motivation thing you could say, dude. 
as a banker, I can yeah, really that, relate. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> Plus, yeah, that filter be. looks pretty cool. So, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> looks fire, dude. Uh, Marcy. Yeah, yeah, man. So, are you, my, my next question is, is, are you doing music full time now? Or are you doing something else to supplement it? Are you still teaching? Um, how are you getting by in, in, the, in these times? Well, man, to tell you the truth, um, the lockdown was obviously, you know, the lockdown was the lockdown, dude. So for the lockdown, I moved back to my parents' place and I, uh, I was helping my dad out with whatever he needed help with or whatever. But yeah, man, it's a full-time thing for me. Like music is all I want to do. So it takes up all my time and it's, it's got basically all my focus, man. So yeah, um, lockdown sucked, but now I've, had three gigs again since last week, Friday. So we're slowly inching towards what we need and where we want to be again, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's great to hear. I'm, Dude, I'm, you know, I remember... No, no, let's go for it. Yeah, 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 no, continue. Sorry, Marcel. No, I just wanted to say that so, it, bro, is, um, it is great. From... <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from, from white... From what you and Marcel are talking about there, you know, about, you know, you being a full-time musician, I just wanted to, to, to add on to, you know, something that I've sort of picked up as well from an interview that uh, Marcy did quite a while back. Um, dude, remind me if I'm wrong, those guys have got like the the moustache and anyways, this band used to, they used to go on tour. I think they had like an entire year where they were like just going on tour, dude. And Where's I remember, the you know, them, the dandies, yes. Thank you. Oh, and sweet. they were basically yeah. saying, yeah, and they were talking about how, like, taxing it is, dude, and how, you know, how much sort of hard work goes into that and, you know, logistics and petrol and, and all these things, dude. And for you, you know, making music sort of full time, um, what would you, would you say you, you come across any challenges at all, you know, that, 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 you know, someone who might be wanting to do music full time, you know, might maybe learn, you know, from your experiences, like, what's this? situation with that 100 percent, dude so basically i'm in a privileged sort of situation where i play solo right so that right off the bat that simplifies things drastically like instead of booking accommodation for four dudes i just have to book accommodation for myself instead of getting gigs at the bigger venues that can actually host full bands i can jam anything from coffee shops to restaurants, to bars, to festivals, to opening shows for guys like Jeremy Loops and stuff like I did last year. So it's, it's a lot easier logistically for one guy to get around. But yes, of course, there are challenges, man. I mean, you know, you still have to be so hands-on with your admin to make sure that you are booking enough gigs in advance because you can't book this week for next week you know what i mean that that's too short notice you have to book like a month or two months in advance so it's a constant ongoing thing to stay above board i guess you could say so yeah man it's especially tour it's there's a lot of planning that goes into tour so for for a band like the dandies it's got to be so tough man because they they are so many members to make sure that everyone's going to have a pillow to rest their head on every night. It's, yeah, it's definitely going to be a lot harder than it is for me. But the thing is, it's so rewarding, dude. It's like coming back from a tour that took three weeks or whatever. Like last year, I, I did a tour of Durban for three weeks. And then I went up to Mozambique for three weeks. And then I went over to Namibia for three weeks. And then came back through Botswana. And I mean, dude, looking back on that, that was just like the most insane time of my life. And while it had its challenges, I literally wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, I saw that uh, you, you played Strab, bro. And you, you aren't, like a couple of artists that have been on the show have actually brought, you know, brought up, you know, Strab. I remember when we had, dude, I'm so terrible now. Like the moment that I need to remember these names. Um, I think it was <laughs> that okay. one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strab, and they were like, it was like the one of the best experiences of their lives. Would you sort of share the same sentiments? Was like how is how was it playing uh, Strap? Oh, dude! Like I was there for nine days. That was my first time in Mozambique. Actually, it was my first time out of the country, dude. So like the first time I get to leave the country, 
is for a music festival that I'm playing at. Oh, man. So, yeah, I actually ran into Bad Peter there at Strab last year. And oh, such cool guys, man. But the whole nine days I was there, I wasn't on earth, dude. I was at Strab, man. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's insane, dude. If you've never been, you have to make a plan to go. It's nuts, what, dude. It's, there's no way to quantify it. Is, it. is it sort of like OP vibes or splashy vibes? Like what? Dude, it's a lot more intimate, man. I mean, every year they only sell 2,500 tickets. So that's, that's it, dude. 2,500 people for like, you could say from the Wednesday all the way through to the Monday. It's very family vibes, dude. Like by the end of the weekend, you feel like everyone there has known each other for years and years. It's a lot more caring than, say, Opikopi. Opikopi is big, dude. There's, there's a lot of people you sort of festival past each other. You know what I mean? But at Strab, everyone's, it's like, it's one breathing organism. Dude, it's very difficult to explain if you haven't been. But it's madness, dude. It's madness. It's regarded as, South Africa's greatest festival outside of South Africa. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what it is, dude. Hey, I dude. It's, it really sounds dope, dude. Everyone that mm. comes through and talks about crap, dude, it's, it's, it's always like a delightful time there. So, yeah, uh, I'm man. super keen to, to, to end up going there. Um, <laughs> I see, bro. So, yeah, dude, I mean, with, with, with you, you know, having, you mentioned obviously playing around, you know, uh, having like a little tour that you did, you know, last year and whatnot. Um, you obviously, Strab wasn't the only one that you played, you know, I saw that, that, that you also played, you know, Railways. And that's also an end that Marcel usually drops there as well, you know. So with your experience sort of touring all over the place, you mentioned Durban and, you know, just South Africa. Um, you know, what was your sort of experience like, you know, with, with that tour? Was it something you expected, you know, when you, when you got into it? Um, yeah, let us in on that. The thing is that the thing that always gets me, dude, is the people you meet on tour, right? So yeah. I, I don't know why it happens the way it happens, but you just meet people that line up with your path. You know what I mean? Like they come across your path and it's just like, dude, you were meant to be there forever. So the one thing that stands out for me from tour is just it's literally the people you meet and the connections you make. Because as soon as you tell people, yeah, man, I'm a musician. I'm actually playing here today. So you might as well stick around for a set or two or whatever. It's just their response to that is so cool, man. They're always so welcoming to musicians. I don't know why, but it's great, dude. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic being on tour, man. <laughs> So as soon as I can, I'm going to go on tour. <laughs> you know, tell me about... a decent chance I stay on tour, dude. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your experience in Bloemfontein, bro. Like, you barely hear about that place. And I think in, in just the history of Sludge as well, I think I only recall about two artists that we've had on that have played Bloemfontein. I think it was Holly Ray and Monga. And sort of what was your experience there, bro? Because like I say, like I on my side barely hear anything about what goes on in that place, you know. So how was your experience down there? You know, how were the people that you met there? Dude, Bloemfontein was, it was an interesting one, man. Like I went there because the first time I was in Bloemfontein was to play the uh, Jeremy Loop show in 2018. And um, that was madness, dude. Like that show was freaking epic. But then um, it sort of happened organically that like next thing I knew, here I am living in Bloemfontein, dude. And at the end of the day, it is a student town. So wherever there are students, there's going to be bars. And wherever there are bars, there's going to be a place for a user to jam, you know. But yeah, totally different people mm -hmm. to like uh, Pretoria, for example, dude. Um, a lot more Afrikaans, as you might imagine. And... Yeah, man, those yeah. people can drink, dude. Wow. <laughs> they got some serious drinking skills, man, in Bloemfontein. Yeah. So you got to be very careful when you're there. But there <laughs> are, um, I actually got some bad news that my favorite venue in Bloemfontein, Scarlet Room, unfortunately closed down during lockdown. And that was like the local Muso hangout, oh. man. So you would go there and then you would just see, you would at least see one other band there, just hanging out, just having a couple of drinks or whatever. So, nah, yeah. Bloemfontein definitely has its, it has its attractive qualities, I could say, man. 
Sure, dude. It is it is a rather sad topic, bro, that, you know, as a result of this lockdown, bro, you've had venues closed down. I know Marcel, you know, covered that, you know, extensively with uh, some of the artists and some of the bands that have come through, you know. And now that sort of everything is sort of slowly opening up, you know, what this is an open question to both of you um you know for 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 you guys as as artists and, and musicians and whatever now that things are, are slowly opening up you know what do you guys think you know should sort of be or what are you, what are your expectations in terms of you know getting back into sort of gigging and whatnot is it going to be an easy transition you know is it going to be difficult you know open question I think it might be quite tough, man, personally, because a lot of places are going to be in recovery mode. So they're going to be focused on trying to get back to where they were before the lockdown came into play. And unfortunately, because entertainment was the first thing to go with the lockdown, I feel like there's a decent chance that it might be the last thing to return fully to normal like it was before. So artists are going to have to, I fear be willing to negotiate their prices a bit further down just to get the gig, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. But yeah, worth yeah, it, mostly. definitely, dude. Definitely, because we, we're yeah. going to have to revive it. And, I mean, no one's going to do it for us, dude, so we got to do it. And in that regard, I'm super positive to just be mm. jamming again. Yeah, dude, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Marcy, do you sort of feel the same way, bro? I guess I'm I'm optimistic to be honest. You know, I'm I'm standing by the whole thing of you know absence makes the heart grow fonder, and you know people would occasionally go to shows and sort of things. And I I'm hoping that with the potential of it having nearly disappeared altogether, makes more people want to go out and experience it and just you know live it up a bit kind of thing. Go to an artist, go watch a band, go watch a musician and these sort of things. And sure, we're in a tough financial situation as well, but hopefully there has been some light shed on to the struggle that has that some that artists specifically, once again, being the first to go. You know, I, I have an optimistic view of this that, you know, people will, will come back in and start bringing some life back into it. It's a very cool outlook, dude. That's a very cool outlook. And I agree with you 100%, dude, because there were a lot of things that you missed a lot during the lockdown and things that you couldn't get. I remember talking to a mate of mine saying how badly I just want to go sit and have a draft while watching some band. I don't even care who the band is, just watching a band play while sipping away at a beer. And I feel like a lot of people share that sentiment as well. So, yeah, man. Cool. I think you just changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad yeah, to hear it. Dude. And, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned it. Yeah, dude, like, like you're mentioning a key word there. You know, you said, you know, watching some bands or sipping on some beer. And I also noticed that is like a constant in, in your Instagram feed is beer and coffee. Like, dude, would, <laughs> would you would you would you consider yourself like a a, a beer and coffee aficionado? No, <laughs> I would say I like beer, and I've <laughs> actually now moved on to whiskey, dude. It just so happens that when I take those oh, photos oh. of that beer for my Instagram, that isn't the first one usually, <laughs> and I just get a point where I just really admire this bottle i'm enjoying and i just feel like i got to share it with the world coffee however yes i'm addicted to coffee dude coffee is life dude <laughs> damn bro are you also are you also like when it comes to your coffee are you also like very pedantic in terms of how it should like be made does it have to be like a certain coffee bean from like ethiopia or brazil or something or is it just like anything goes bro? it doesn't it's not really that serious nah dude anything goes man as long as it looks like coffee, sort of smells like coffee, and sort of tastes like coffee, and maybe has that caffeine kick that we're all familiar with, then I'm going to be good with it, man. Just Not too keen on the re-coffee coffee vibe. Man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. Anything goes, man. Anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, solid. Uh, Marcy, coming back to you. So, uh, you... You've been working predominantly as a, a solo artist, and you know you say that you're that in a lot of senses you're lucky to do so because it's way easier to plan sort of bigger events in terms of touring and stuff like that. 
do you at any point see yourself playing with the band? Have you played with the band? And how would you go about your recording process? Would you record in a raw acoustic, raw acoustic form or would you get musicians to work with you? It's a kind of a multifaceted question. Yeah, it's a really good question, man. Um, so I've always loved playing with bands and uh, I did play with a band, yeah, a couple of years ago. We were called Blackwood Freighter, Blues Rock Trio. That's basically how I got into the music scene I could say was with a band and stuff it definitely gave you a certain level of confidence standing on stage at least with the two mates of yours you know what I mean they, they definitely give you a bit of a, a support network to fall back on so in terms of playing with a band again I definitely did I definitely want to I'm actually on the lookout right now for a drummer first of all and then potentially a bassist I might stick to a duo for a little while just drums and guitar see how that goes and then, yeah, especially for festivals, man, I feel like a band brings a, a real vibe and a lot of power to a festival as opposed to playing solo. So, yeah, I definitely want to start looking at bands again. Regarding recording, man, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure, dude. I'm not too sure if I would go the session muso route. So just any random guy who's been recording a long time and obviously is going to have the expertise as opposed to a guy that I've had a couple of rehearsals with and have come to know on a personal level, you know what I mean? I, I feel like that might be more beneficial to jam with a guy that you've jammed with a few times, just because he's going to obviously know a little better what I want, you know, the sound I'm after and all that type of stuff. So speaking of the benefits of playing solo, that is one of them is maintaining full control over what the, final outcome sounds like um, as opposed to with a band you've sort of got to share opinions and you know it's a bit of a comp a bit more of a compromise and stuff so i'm definitely looking at it dude if i hope that answers your question no definitely it does I mean, you, you clearly have also like thought about it as well so it, oh, it, dude, it, definitely, <laughs> it definitely answers the question and if you yeah. if you could have an ideal band, I don't know if you have anyone in mind. I don't know, if, like who would be your your roll call? Who would be your let me recruit? Dude, I played at Jazz on the Lawn in Bloemfontein, which is like a, a monthly thing that they do, where they get all sorts of different jazz and um, well, I'd say blues as well. Obviously, I mean I was there, so. I played with this band called On Point, On Point Music, and it's basically a band for hire. So you get keys, you get bass, and you get drums. And all three of those musicians were three of the best musicians I've seen, dude. That, that drummer was absolute madness. So that bassist was like, it looked like he was born from Victor Wooten himself, dude. And the keys was oh, dude, just nuts, man. The, those guys were so, so good. So if I could choose a band right now, that I would go on tour with, it would probably be on point, dude. Those guys were really, really good. A man of class. No? They were Victor, Victor Wooten. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Naz? Um, yeah, dude. Like you, you also mentioned earlier that you've actually played um, alongside Jeremy Loops. Now, dude, how was that experience for you? Oh, that was cool, dude, because, um, like I said, it was my first time in Bloemfontein. So, and Bloom, let's be real, dude, they don't have, um, they're not too blues orientated, <laughs> I can say. So, I opened the whole night. So, when I started playing, there was no one, dude, no one in front of the stage at all. I was jamming to an empty room, basically. And with each passing song, the crowd got bigger and bigger, dude. And eventually, there was like, oh, I don't know, like maybe 500 people that have eventually pulled in by like my fifth or sixth song. So that was really cool to see this, this, um, this crowd just forming in front of me. These guys that clearly hadn't had too much exposure to the blues and stuff. But by the time Jeremy Loops came on, the house was full, dude. And oh man, what a vibe. Like it was pretty electric, dude. You know what I mean? But I mean, it's Jeremy Loops at the end of the day, dude. Everyone was there to see him. So you could hardly hear him singing over the crowd, singing his song to him. And that made me a little jealous. I won't lie. <laughs> did, you, did you get an opportunity to sort of meet him? You know, as the artist who was 
you know, opening up. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I saw him backstage. We briefly chatted and stuff. He was obviously in a different mindset having um, just performed. And so we also stayed in the same guest house together. So the following morning, we had a brief discussion about the music industry and stuff before he got on his bus and left for the next show, man. I have no idea where he went to play. But yeah, very brief discussion with the guy. Seemed like a cool enough guy. Dude, that's like, that's like some gold, bro. Like, what was that conversation, dude? And what, like, dude, tell us I mean, what you guys were talking about. <laughs> oh, dude, he was basically talking about international jamming, dude, like jamming overseas and stuff. Um, I can't exactly recall. It was very brief, dude, and I was pretty hungover. I'm not going to lie. So <laughs> I, I could have paid more attention, let's put it that way. But yeah, man, he was just, uh, I don't know. I, I really couldn't actually tell you, dude. I know that he mentioned playing, uh, where was it, man? He mentioned he played, I think it was Spain, he said. Where in Spain, mm. he says the the dudes just party way too hard. That, so he's probably not going to go back to Spain too soon, lest he wants to die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that is solid, bro. Uh, Marcel. No man, I, 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 when you when you talk about this and you know your conversation with Jeremy, it, it reminds me of our conversation with Garen Watkins or oh, Gareth. Sorry, God, I'm sorry, Gareth Watkins, and how he was saying <laughs> the, the 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 public eye. You know when you know Jeremy Loops has become a very much a you know a property of the public in that sense. And yes, um, you know, uh, you I think you will really hear of someone like that just being an outright dick to someone, whether it's an opening artist or, or something like that, because of just how much in the public eye that they are and how much yeah. it could affect their, their image as well. So uh, that's, I, I would love to have a conversation with the man considering his, his status in the music scene, but it's, it's interesting yeah, to how much of that was at play. And um, brings me to a question mm. of how, how would you say, you perceive being in the public eye is it something that you you've craved as a lot of artists tend to do like you know it's kind of that that catch a lot of us are very anxious about everything but also crave that attention where where would you say you fall into that that kind of scale that balance oh well man i'd be lying if i said i didn't want to at least you know sign a few autographs walking out of like I don't know, game or something. <laughs> That's the first shop that came to mind. Um, I'd be lying if I said that that wasn't an appealing thought. But then at the same time, I feel like it's, it's, that shouldn't be what matters most. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what I think of when I think of my goals for the future. What I think of as my goal for the future is just stepping out on stage and seeing an ocean of people need that's that would be great i want to perform to really large crowds but the public eye itself dude i don't know like it's got a certain appeal to it but then also i can't think of anything good that's ever come off of a famous person walking out in public and getting swarmed by paparazzi you know what i mean i can't think of any positive that's ever come from that it's definitely it's a very level-headed way of looking at it and i I can i can agree uh, I just want to point out, lads, before we go on, the the Zoom timer is on four minutes. We'll just strike up another one after this. We'll send through another invite. But if you get cut mid yeah, sentence, cool. don't, don't stress. All right, sweet, man. No problem. <laughs> you know, just on just a, a continuation of what Marcel said, I want to link this up with something that, uh, obviously, like I said, you know, Devo sent us some some. some content as well and i want to link it up to what marcel just said there about being sort of in the public eye and everything this is a question that barely comes up on slow in the ground this is probably going to be the third time ever um about your relationship status dude yeah um he's written down here that um this was apparently an answer that you had i think in one of the other interviews where you were like i'm single i've been for a while and we'll probably help it Dude, thought sort of behind that, like why? Why are you so adamant that you know what? I want to stay single. Like, what is it about being single that sort of appeals to you? And you know, being a person who is a guitarist and who is bound to be in the public eye, how do you handle you know female attention? Well, see, that's the thing, dude. Is like, I mean, I'm. If all goes according to plan, I'm going to be on the road 
we're talking like nine months out of the year. And realistically speaking, there's no way that a girl is just going to be able to join me for that whole tour. You know what I mean? Like she's got her life to live as well. And like, I don't know, it, it'd take a very special girl to just be cool with me leaving for nine months. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I don't know. I, I think it's just, I've got things that I have to deal with right now already. So why add complications, dude? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right now it's quite fun. It's quite light and breezy. It's easy going. So, I mean, hey, let's ride that way for a while. <laughs> a solid answer. Yeah, man. So, this is a question that I ask a lot. But, you know, with Blues Guys, it can always be, it can be interesting, you know, at, uh, see maybe if I can guess. But who would you say are your, your inspirations as a as a blues musician? Are you looking kind of like towards your, your Stevie Ray Vaughan side? Or are you looking... Where 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 did you draw your inspiration from? What what kind of music led you to want to make this type of music? Oh well, I grew up listening to Dire Straits, thanks to my dad and my uncle. So Mark Knopfler is a huge uh, inspiration to me. Definitely has been my whole life. I mean, Sultans of Swing is basically the reason I started playing guitar or wanted to start playing guitar. But in terms of ongoing and fairly new inspirations, like the last couple of years or so. I'd have to turn to local guys, Dan Petlansky and Albert Frost, man. Both of those guys are just everything I want to be. <laughs> man, I got to watch Dan Petlansky live like last year sometime. And what a fucking oh, yeah. experience, man. Dude, just it's from madness, a sheer dude. technical aspect. Like he makes it look, some of the stuff that he does looks so easy, but Lord, he's Ugh, dude, unbelievably he's good. He's just so good, dude. He's just so good, man. So yeah, like um, he's obviously very uh, inspired by and very driven by Stevie Ray Vaughan, and you can hear it in his playing. So that's where I get all my Stevie Ray Vaughan from is from Dan Petlansky. So I actually haven't. Um, paid a lot of attention to Stevie Ray Vaughan's music or anything because I hear so much of it in Dan Petlansky's music and I don't know the dude's just got a serious talent about him man he, no, he's, he like does, you said man. everything he does it just he, it looks so easy dude it really does yeah like Naz uh, yeah dude like um, you know w- w- earlier when we were talking about you sort of having played Strab and you you know going on tour and everything you know what would you say is I'm just looking, you know, towards the future now because we're almost at the end. Um, you know, what would you say your number one goal is when it comes to, you know, um, the festivals that you want to play at? Which are, give me your top three um, festivals that you like to play at one day. Ooh, top three festivals. All right, well, um, let's start with the local one. I definitely want to play Smoking Dragon. That would be a great one for me. But thinking bigger picture and a few years down the line, most probably, I would love to play Glastonbury. So Glastonbury would be a big, big one for me in Scotland, obviously. And then I'd have to say Coachella, man. Hopefully the, the, um, hopefully it still suits my genre of music by the time I get there, because obviously, you know, like the top 50 has changed a lot in the last 10 years. So, Hopefully there's still a space for me at Coachella, but yeah, Coachella and Glastonbury are two major festivals I would love to do in my lifetime. Hundred mm, percent, bro. That's some some really awesome insights, uh, Marcy. No man, that's that that those are two very very big goals, man. Like it's, it's just two like of your your biggest festivals in the world to be honest if i'm if i'm not mistaken that's what i'm saying dude who's aiming small here marcel who's aiming small dude? <laughs> <laughs> well considering that naz and i dream of playing uh the the viking viking open air you know uh, oh yeah i can relate i can relate let me ask you a question marcel dude being a guitarist yourself man who are your inspirations who led you to where you are now in your journey of playing guitar, man. Well, interesting enough, I have a, a similar story of my, my dad being very involved in music and being raised kind of on also Dire Straits, but Black Sabbath, um, ZZ Top, and, you know, oh, these awesome. sort of guys. And 
I, I kind of just decided to pick up guitar as a, you know, a way to get closer and just slowly but surely fell in love with the instrument. In terms of inspirations now, it's honestly a lot of your, your YouTube guys. It's a lot of your, your YouTube guitarists and, and stuff like that. These are the guys who heavily inspire me to, to create and think kind of differently. But in terms of famous guitarists, I would have to say either Jimmy Page or Sinister Gates. Okay, geez, dude. Very good answer. Wow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I actually thought that Albert Frost started the whole playing with a violin bow thing, you know. I saw him do that at uh, Misty Waters, and when I saw him do it, like, obviously my mind exploded a little bit. And um, I thought that was his thing, and then I found out much later, actually, that Jimmy, Jimmy Page, Page was thing. the first to do it. Dude. No, it's a Jimmy Page thing, dude. Solid, yeah. Yeah, no, I said I remember watching that, that from one of the, those live shows and thinking, God damn, I've never played with a violin bow, <laughs> but... I've definitely, definitely just constantly looked at improving. Yeah, man. That's crazy, dude. It's crazy how, like, so many years after the guitar was invented and dudes are still coming up with new fascinating ways to get sounds out of it. But Naz, dude, what made you want to be a drummer, man? <laughs> and dude, Are drums the only <laughs> instrument you play as well? Or do you play anything else? He plays the meat flute. Dude, honestly, like... <laughs> 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 dude like uh, <laughs> honestly with me dude it was sort of like a chance thing you know um i remember back in the day it was myself keegan and i think wade Pereira, and we were basically we went to keegan's church and you know we were just messing around and they were like yo dude go on drums and then it basically just started off there it was like a, a chance thing really i never sort of wanted i wouldn't say i didn't want to it was sort of like i'd never even thought about you know even playing okay. a drum set or, or playing music at all so shout out to those guys it was sort of like a chance type thing and then yeah dude with anything else i'd say maybe just a bit on the production side and even then i wouldn't call myself a producer myself. it's just you know producing here and there just for myself something to listen to sometimes i send through to, to to certain people and if they like it they fucks with it you know we go with it but yeah okay. dude, that's, that's pretty the vibe bro. yeah and and you know just 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 to sort of um you know like like uh, Marcel and i were just discussing you know before we close out we were going to do one two questions each this is my final question i want to sort of relate it to you know all the all the just to take it away from the music a bit all the movie buffs and if you want to into series and stuff bro um you know it's my understanding um that you know horror movie you were a fan of horror movies before until they started becoming you know very predictable um what is yeah. it about horror movie that is very predictable because i can tell you on my end as well bro i sort of felt out of love with them because i just felt like it was always the silence and the jump scare and it's just you know it's the same recipe it's, just, it's yeah you yeah. stole my answer it's dude you stole my answer it's it's <laughs> it's the jump scare dude the jump scare it's like they figured that out with like friday the 13th jason Voorhees and his hockey mask and his machete now sure back then it was really scary dude like wow that's proper shit but now that's they played that one trick over and over there's nothing else there's oh. nothing they can follow up with dude to make it like to hold my intrigue so i watched the first it movie well not the first one obviously the the, the first remake of it and that was actually fairly decent and then the other day i watched the second one and it was abysmal dude it was the most <laughs> shocking display of theatrics i've seen dude it was terrible 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 so yeah man i'm i'm more on the thriller train now eh? <laughs> dude i really feel like it's just literally the, a battle to see who can do jump scares better like for me i think a movie that did it quite well was uh the conjuring 2 i think for me that yeah, one there was wasn't bad but then everything else is just like oh man this is the same shit just repeated over and over it's ridiculous exactly dude wash rinse repeat wash rinse repeat dude it's they've got like they've got this cookie cutter template of what they think a horror movie should be and now every horror movie is made the same way so i keep watching them dude i keep watching them in the hopes that this one's gonna like really be good and it's never <laughs> it's never good anymore it's oh, so sad man <laughs> yeah dude before we close out and get all your details i'm going to recommend that you check out uh it's a horror sort of thriller as well it's called get out it's a different concept to like the whole jump scare thing it's more thought-provoking as well do check dude, that out is it that highly is recommend. it that movie 
is it that movie of the the black guy that starts dating the white girl and then her family yes. like yeah. torments him i need to watch that dude i've been meaning to watch that actually so thank you for reminding Pretty me much, dude. Yeah. <laughs> sweet bro no problem uh yeah dude before before i close off the show and we get all your handles i don't know if marcy has anything left on his side bro yeah just one one more quick question from my side with your yeah, thoughts on the the horror movie industry or the 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 rinse repeat you know the the repetition thing would you say that that yeah. carries over to other mediums have you also noticed a similar trend in for instance music and other things like that well i've noticed it in pop music dude definitely and i mean really who hasn't man i mean i don't know if you guys saw that picture but there was there was a pic a while ago of like they had um freddie mercury's lyrics for bohemian rhapsody on the left side and then on the right side they had the lyrics for girls or something by beyonce and like the thing about the Beyonce lyrics was it was one line that was repeated for like, I don't know, what is it, like four and a half minutes. And this Bohemian Rhapsody has these complicated lyrics. It's a real story that you can follow along with as the listener. And I feel like people have just taken like to really shitty lyrics, dude, that they think sounds catchy. And then they repeat that catchy phrase over and over. And, you know, like that's their hook, dude. Their hook is that, one catchy rhyme and then they they hammer on that the whole time i'm a lyric fan dude so like that's the way that i get caught first of all by the opening riff like most guitarists do obviously and then you keep my interest with a good lyric and pop music just it keeps dropping the ball in my opinion on that front dude so yes it definitely bleeds over from horror movies to horrible music dude definitely and I, I, I can understand that perspective. I, I do, however, think that in context, uh, like, you know, sort of meaningless lyrics for a good time, uh, in, in context can, can be a good thing. But obviously when it's something that's rinsed and repeated, you know, it sort of loses that when you want something of a bit more substance, of a bit more depth. But, you know, if you don't want to think, you just want to kind of lose it you know i can understand why that would be so appealing but yes dude, Nats, this... take us away sweet dude <laughs> no sorry what were you saying something there bro <laughs> oh man it's just an example i've got is like um for example you before you even listen to a taylor swift song you know that it's going to be about a breakup dude you know what i mean that's basically <laughs> all i'm trying to say that's basically what I'm gonna say. All right, Naz, take it away, dude. Take it away. No, I'm sorry because my, my my girlfriend has to hear that. She's a Taylor Swift fan, and she just just packed up laughing in the background. So, oh well, dude. Like, apologize to her, and I'll make it up to her when I meet you guys. And I'll like, what does she drink, dude? What does your girlfriend drink? What's your favorite she's drink? She's holding you to it. It was just a great moment. So I had to share it. Hundred percent, dude. I'm gonna get her a drink, bro. Is she a tequila or a Jagermeister fan? What does she do? Tequila, apparently. <laughs> tequila. We're all hitting tequilas, dude. I'll make up for it. But that's my opinion on Taylor Swift, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, bro, listening. Closing, where can people get in touch with you, all your social media handles and stuff? Oh, man, if you want to be friends on Facebook, I can't guarantee that I'm going to accept, but I probably will. It's just Kenny Hughes. Um, my Facebook page is at Kenny Hughes Official. And my Instagram handle is Kenny Hughes underscore artist. In hindsight, I could have made that Kenny Hughes official as well. It would have been so much simpler, but whatever. Kenny Hughes underscore artist for Instagram. Hey, that is solid, bro. And, uh, thank you so much, dude. Listen, we can't thank you enough for coming to the show, bro. Um, you know, there was just so much more that we could have spoken about, but due to time constraints, super chill vibes, bro. I know we will catch up again on round two. So, um, if you're listening dude. to this, um, do catch this episode on SoundCloud. Uh, we are basically Sludge Underground Podcast, and on Apple Podcasts, we are Sludge Underground Podcast, and also on Spotify, Sludge Underground Podcast. On social media, Facebook, we are at Sludge Underground. On Twitter, at Sludge Earthy One, and on Instagram, at Sludge Underground. And for myself, it's at Zwani Earthy One. Marcel, who are you online? 
I am on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as Marcel Smuts. Please subscribe to the channel. I've got so much coming on, and I'm getting closer to that 250 subs. I would just shameless plug aside. Please love me. And you can find me on Instagram as Thorns of Sludge. Dude, that's yeah, exactly what I mean, right? <laughs> I should have yeah. done that. I should have had everything the same name, dude. That's what I should have done, man. <laughs> but whatever. Dude, you literally can still change it, though. Mm. Dude, I'm changing it right now as we speak. Watch me <laughs> unlock my phone, dude. <laughs> oh, it's official, dude. Dude, it's, you just you just gave us a sludge exclusive. You are changing it officially on sludge. <laughs> it's changed. What oh, is it now? Officially, dude. Yeah. What has news reported? I'm making. To? <laughs> I'm making everything Kenny use official because it sounds official, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, guys, before we close out, Kenny, we have to close out with one of your tracks. Which track of yours should we close out with? Uh, Jam Wicked Ways, dude. Please do me a favor. Wicked 100%. Ways. 100%. Oh, wait, dude. We'll, we'll, ch we'll chat more about Wicked Ways uh, a bit later on. Um, guys, we're closing out with Wicked Ways by Kenny. I just want to quickly send a shout out to uh, the Durban Creative Awards for nominating us for Best Content Creator and uh, if anyone wants to vote for us, um, just please just SMS uh, Sludge Underground to 35959 and just vote for us guys, I mean all your votes will be appreciated, we also got a little competition running, you know, if you vote we'll get your name down and we'll give you a hamper Now as you're breaking up a bit there Brother Bear. Fucking sludge and you a German poison beer to give you. Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure that that did not come through clearly at all. But to give context, <laughs> uh, we are going to be giving away a hamper of some Durban poison beers and one of our new hoodies to basically one lucky person who votes for us and all you need to do is send us a screenshot of the, your basically your successful vote and that will enter you into a competition to win some some cool goodies between the uh, sludge merch and some Durban poison stuff as well sweet so yeah guys um i don't know if i'm coming through now but yeah once again this sms sludge and around to 35959 and yeah, send this a screen gap. Um, sweet, Marcel. Thank you so much for that, bro. Um, Kenny, thank you once again for joining us on the show. We're going to be closing out one of your tracks. Um, what did you say that track was Wicked again, ways. bro? I'm sorry, my mind is terrible. Wicked ways, Wicked man. Ways. Guys, so I'd just bro. like to say um, until next I'd just like to say thanks from it, my side as well. You guys are nuts. Very, very cool. I had a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to round two, dude. We're going to have to do a follow-up for sure. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to. So, guys, That's we're closing so out with Wicked Way. Sweet, enjoy. Cheers. Sweet, man. Got no soul, hard as a diamond, but she's as brittle as stone. And she dresses fashion with a satisfaction. Oh, so much rain dressed, eh? the latest fashion, yeah. I'm caught in the moment, surviving off of you. Caught in the moment, surviving off of you. I'm caught in the moment, surviving off of you. And this is a fight that I just can't lose. Pray to heaven to give me seven minutes to change my life before I become the next a sacrifice. Ask amazing grace to show a beautiful face. Are we are cursed in life and by wicked, wicked. 
way By wicked ways I'm caught in the moment Surviving off of you I'm caught in the moment Surviving off of you Of you I'm caught in the moment Surviving off of you oh, oh. This is a fight that I just I just came Next 